Thanks for watching AI Weekly Update from Henry AI Labs. The headline of this week is it looks like computer vision is officially being taken over by transformers. This latest paper from Facebook AI shows a data efficient strategy for training image transformers. This doesn't rely on any external data like the JFT 300 million data set. It can run on a single eight GPU machine trained over three days. And the core here is a new knowledge distillation technique, distilling the priors in the convolutional neural network into the image transformer. Then we'll look at this surprising paper, pre-training a language model without human language. This is about uh, what happens if, if on the data side of this self-supervised language modeling, we replace something like Wikipedia books corpus or scientific literature corpus with amino acid sequences, JavaScript code, or artificially constructed data sets. And this teaches us a lot about the pre-training and then fine tuning pipeline. Then we'll look at evaluating agents without rewards. This is the latest in the really exciting study on intrinsic motivation. Agents that look to influence their environment, learn the rules of their environments, or deliberately uh, seek out particular readings on their input sensors in order to get a sense of their environment rather than just direct optimization as some kind of task reward. The authors are going to explore how these intrinsic uh, motivation metrics correlate with how humans learn to play games like Atari or these Minecraft reinforced learning environments and how the way that humans explore correlates with these intrinsic motivation metrics. Then we'll look at large scale clinical interpretation of genetic variants using evolutionary data and deep learning. The idea here is how can we see the slight variations in human disease related genes and how can we correlate these with clinical decisions or how can we use these uh, slight variants in disease related genes to make better clinical decisions. The core idea of this paper is that instead of trying to fit these uh, noisy, sparse, small data sets of clinical labels with respect to these larger uh, gene variants, we're going to instead look at generative models and particularly a variational autoencoder, which is the same kind of uh, methodology as BERT in order to learn a generative model that can generalize better to making these kind of predictions about the properties of these uh, gene variants compared to say fitting these supervised learning labels that are uh, inherently small data sets and challenging with respect to the overfitting problem. Then we'll look at few shot text generation with pattern exploiting training. Pattern exploiting training is a really interesting line of research as looking at uh, more into the handoff between the pre-trained and then fine tuned pipeline, having a better way of transitioning these pre-trained language models into downstream tasks. In this case, they're now targeting abstractive summarization tasks. Then we'll look at this article in the gradient. When Bert plays the lottery, all tickets are winning. This is written by Anna Rogers, the author of the Bertology uh, literature review that surveys all the papers that have since used Bert since it came out in around 2018. And uh, she's looking to describe how the lottery ticket hypothesis can teach us about how uh, Bert really works. And unfortunately, they don't find a great uh, understanding of Bert from the lottery tickets, but they do find that Bert has this interesting robustness to these sub networks. So in the same line of trying to investigate these transformers, see what kind of dependencies they've learned and what kind of uh, input they're attending over, this great uh, blog post from Jay Almar on interfaces for explaining transformer language models shows some of the different tools that we have in order to visualize these input attention heat maps, neuron activations, and then other, uh, other looks at uh, how we're visualizing these heat maps. You see these little uh, percentage weights on how much we're attending over our input sequence when we're making this individual output and this interactive visualization is really cool for communicating this idea of transformers. So 2020 is almost over and we're starting to see recaps of everything that's happened in AI and deep learning in 2020. I was really impressed by this awesome summary of these different papers. It starts off with a video describing the overall landscape and then with respect to each of these individual survey papers, it has a quick uh, video description linked to the paper linked to the code if available and a two sentence description from the author to or however many short description from the author on the paper itself. Then we'll look at Microsoft's 2020 research recap, different areas like uh, general things like the deep speed library, and then different things like their uh, new research in programming languages or medical health and genomics. Then we'll look at this really great edition of the natural language processing newsletter from Sebastian Ruder, uh, describing things like uh, efficiency, procedural generation and minimum viable data sets. In this AI Weekly Update, we'll look at DeepMind's annual report, why it's hard to run a commercial AI lab. This is a description of how uh, DeepMind is a pretty expensive research lab to run. And so in order for Google to justify paying for this, they might need to transition into more of a product facing company rather than an emphasis on science itself. Then we'll look at the latest edition of the Hugging Face monthly newsletter, particularly with the emphasis on the Dataset Sprint 2020. 
So they've described how they've added over 600 data sets to this library. So they have these online data loaders and efficient data pre-processing. So this means for us as deep learning researchers that we can spend less time cleaning and loading data sets and more time training these models and testing out different ideas. Finally, we look at Hugging Face is announcing a new auto NLP library. I'll quickly explain uh, what might motivate this tool and I highly recommend joining the waitlist for beta access and filling out this quick survey to help Hugging Face get a sense of how you might be using an auto NLP tool. The headline story of the week is that Facebook AI has produced a data efficient image transformer. The previous uh, best known image transformer was developed by Google and it was known as the Vision Transformer. This animation shows a quick diagram of what this architecture looks like. You take an image and then you divide it up into patches and you treat these patches as if they're tokens in the same sense that you have the sequence of tokens in natural language processing or these other applications that use this transformer self-attention architecture. And then you also have a uh, patch embedding similar to the position embedding in the sequence modeling for natural language processing. So the, the new paper from Facebook still is going to use the same strategy of breaking the image up into patches. The key difference is a new knowledge distillation technique from the convolutional network into the image transformer that's going to save a ton of uh, computation time. So as reported here, they train this model with a single 8 GPU machine over three days. And you know, it's still not an everyday machine, but compared to what is used to train the vision transformer, in addition to using a lot of computation to train this model from the researchers at Google, Google often uses this um, JFT 300 million unlabeled private data set when they're uh, testing out these new self-training loops and things like that in order to boost their representation learning pipeline. So this, is, this new method from Facebook is also not using any uh, outside data. So this plot really tells an interesting story that um, image transformers are surpassing convolutional neural networks on the ImageNet benchmark. So the efficient net is the product of neural architecture search, where you find the perfect hyperparameters to scale up the image resolution, the width of the filters, and the depth of the network. It's a really carefully designed convolutional network with uh, you know, tons of GPU hours done to search for the perfect configuration of the convolutional network. And now we're seeing this new image transformer model that is surpassing the performance of efficient net. And these blue dots show the performance of the previous vision transformer model. So we see what a huge improvement this paper is reporting. So now we'll dive into a little more about uh, what's new about this knowledge distillation strategy that allows training this uh, image transformer. So first this uh, section three is a quick description of how the transformer is generalized from say token sequence modeling into images. Same idea as the vision transformer from Google, they break the image up into patches and then they have a fixed patch embedding that uh, gives the model a sense of the relative position because the um, transformer is a set operation. So it wouldn't know that uh, say this patch originally came from the top left corner or the center crop or something like that unless you provide it that additional uh, position embedding. But here's the thing that I think is really interesting, the distillation through attention. So this is the architecture of their model. So similar to uh, the BERT model, in BERT you have this output vector where the vector still has the same uh, embedding dimension size as the input table, but what you do is you uh, index this last token and then you pass this embedding into the feed forward layer and that is the classification head or the, you know, the bottleneck that pipelines this series of representations into a classification head. So the researchers at Facebook are going to slice the last token as well to form a knowledge distillation projection. So they're going to index this token, learn a mapping that turns this into a comparable uh, set of features with the teacher. And then the other interesting thing is that the teacher is going to be a convolutional neural network. So it essentially distills the priors, the spatial invariants encoded in the convolutional network into the image transformer by using this new way of slicing the representation on the transformer. In deep learning, we've decided on the pre-train then fine-tune pipeline is a successful way to train deep neural networks. We usually pre-train these natural language processing models by having them do language modeling on some kind of corpus. This corpus could be uh, Wikipedia, books, scientific papers, all sorts of things. So researchers have been taking apart two sides of the pre-train and fine-tune pipeline with respect to pre-training. And this is with respect to tasks and data. So on the task side, later on in this uh, weekly update video, 
we'll look at a new approach for the pattern exploiting training that's leveraging the Pegasus pre-training task. So Pegasus is a pre-training task that's more suited for downstream fine tuning on abstractive summarization compared to say classification or regression tasks or pairwise similarity. So on the other side of the ball, there's the data that's being used to pre-train these models. So this paper won the, uh, I think it was the best paper award at the ACL 2020 conference, Don't Stop Pre-Training, Adapt Language Models to Domains and Tasks. This shows the importance of having this pre-training data that say your language modeling before you fine tune it into a classification task, having it be at least in the same domain, the same kind of data. So if you're doing a scientific literature mining task, then pre-training on say sports articles isn't gonna be as useful as scientific, scientific papers. I mean, obviously, but this shows concretely, you know, what this means with respect to say filtering from a large Wikipedia corpus and then some kind of downstream task where it's not so obvious what the domain overlap is. But this paper, pre-training a language model without human language is even more surprising. It's showing that uh, any kind of data corpus that has inherent structure in it is still useful for pre-training these models. So they look at uh, JavaScript code, amino acid sequences, and they construct artificial data sets to probe for the intrinsic properties of these uh, pre-training data sets that result in quality fine-tuning performance. So this paper is asking an important question about the data that we're using to pre-train these models. So as a quick reminder, this is the pre-train and fine-tune pipeline we're talking about. In stage one, we do mass language modeling pre-training, also known as self-supervised learning, where we have our data set, in this case, uh, say this is, these are amino acid sequences and we've masked out one of these amino acid sequences or amino acids and then we're predicting which one has been masked out or you mask out words and so on or mask out code in our JavaScript example and then you predict the mass out token and this intermediate representation is the product of this pre-training. You then take this representation and you port it over to the next task, uh, add a new classification layer and then it takes this previously learned weights and learns a new projection for the downstream task. And this is evaluated on the, say, 10 glue benchmarks. And these are like a text classification tasks or pairwise comparison, like, say, the core question pairs for duplicate uh, question detection or the STS, semantic textual similarity, where you're just doing uh, comparing two sentences and saying if they're similar or not semantically. So I really like how this paper, uh, first it describes each of the data sets used, the amino acid sequence corpora, the JavaScript, and then they construct these artificial data sets. And they also use uh, these baselines. The baselines are designed to see the impact of the token distribution and pre-training. So this is a really interesting question. Say, um, you know, you have certain words, like even just taking this sentence right here, we use two baseline pre-trained data set for our experiments. Let's say um, each of these papers, each of these pre-trained data sets, they have a distribution over how frequently the word tokens are appearing. And this distribution shift is going to be totally different when you're on your downstream data set. Even just say, say if we uh, had a histogram of the word frequency for pre-training a language model without human language, and then we compared it to don't stop pre-training, the word frequency distributions would be completely different. So they actually do find that this doesn't matter too much with pre-training, which is an interesting question. But so they, uh, they structure their questions in a really interesting way that makes it uh, really nice for the sake of looking through it for us. The first question they ask is structured data all you need for pre-training? So in the same way that they're exploring these structured data sets like the structure in the amino acid sequences and the JavaScript code, they're also constructing an artificial data set that they can algorithmically generate this hierarchical nesting structure. So it reminds me of this paper, Transformers as Soft Reasoners Over Language. In this paper, what they do is they uh, train the models on these artificially generated data sets that have this kind of uh, rules and then inferences from the rules structures or facts and then rules. So Alan is blue, Alan is rough or, you know, descriptions of Alan, Bob, Charlie and Dave. And then they have the rules of how you combine these properties of Alan, Bob, Charlie and Dave. And then you ask inference questions like Bob is green and you would use the other characteristics of Bob, like Bob is big and Bob is round to infer that Bob is green. And the really interesting takeaway from this paper is that they can train these models on chains of logic of say uh, three to five, and then it can generalize to seven. So it can generalize to chaining more facts together than it was than it had seen in the training data. So this is a really interesting paper on the same idea of uh, what kind of structured data can we construct for pre-training that might result in interesting behavior in the downstream fine-tuned model. The second question is, does pre-training data token distribution affect the performance on downstream tasks? 
This is what we were previously talking about. The word distribution of, say, just this paragraph compared to this one is completely different as we hop from language modeling this to this. We should expect some kind of downstream performance change, but they show that this actually does have little influence. And this could be just because these data sets are pretty large. So they probably still have a kind of normal, not normal as in like, you know, Gaussian distributed, but normal as in what is similar in terms of word frequency distribution. The next question is, does token numbers mismatch between pre-training and fine-tuning affect downstream performance? So I think this is with respect to the vocabulary size. Again, you might have a much smaller vocabulary in your downstream task than you would when you're mass language modeling on all of Wikipedia or some kind of data set like that. The next question is, further fine-tuning with English mass language modeling before fine-tuning on glue. So this is the question of, say, having three stages where you first go from uh, language modeling the JavaScript code then doing the English mass language modeling on, say, Wikipedia, and then going to fine-tuning on the Glue benchmark. So overall, this is a really exciting paper, interesting study about analyzing the data side of our pre-training with respect to this pre-training and then fine-tuning pipeline. Evaluating agents without rewards is addressing two of the biggest challenges in reinforcement learning, and these are reward engineering as well as exploration. So one strategy to exploration that's been developed is intrinsic motivation, or having internal rewards in the agent that aren't so dependent on the specific task reward for whatever it's doing. So here's a great example of this. Say this agent is trying to reach this goal. One way of designing the task reward would be say the L1 or L2 distance from the objective. So the way the agent would try to ma uh, maximize or minimize its distance to the goal is to just move forward and then get stuck in this uh, local optima. It's gonna get right on the wall and it will have you know, on the way to the wall, it'll have been just increasing its reward function and increasing its reward until it's stuck along the wall. But if the idea of the agent is just to pursue a new state, then it'll, you know, explore this way and then it'll explore this way, this way, eventually reaching the goal. So a great book about this is titled Why Greatness Cannot Be Planned, The Myth of the Objective. This is about how a direct optimization can be deceptive for agents and instead we need to have some kind of intrinsic motivation some other way of exploring the environment to get around just solely optimizing for a direct reward. In evaluating agents without rewards, the authors explore three different popular techniques for intrinsic motivation. So the first of which is input entropy. Input entropy encourages encountering rare sensory inputs measured by a learned density model. So say you're a vision-based robotic system, in this case you'd receive high intrinsic reward for finding some new pixel configuration as you're exploring the visual space of your environment. The next uh, intrinsic motivation explored is information gain. Information gain rewards the agent for discovering the rules of its environment. So say you're playing uh, these Atari games like Montezuma's Revenge, and you learn something like, if I go into the fire, I'm taken back to the start of the dungeon. Learning these kind of rules of the environment would reward you with this intrinsic reward. The last of which is empowerment. Empowerment rewards the agent for maximizing the influence it has over its sensory inputs or environment. So there's a great paper on this from DeepMind where, what, so what the agent is trying to do basically is, uh, in the, say, say in the vision-based robotics example, again, it's pursuing this per particular thing to see. But a better example of this is these uh, touch-based robotics or robotic systems that have these physical state sensors and you're trying to deliberately put yourself in some kind of state configuration with respect to these uh, like physical variables like the you know like torque on the motors or the hip joints all these kinds of things so these are three different strategies for intrinsic motivation input entropy information gain and empowerment so given these three different strategies for intrinsic motivation the authors are going to try to correlate this with human behavior so they have a fixed offline reinforcement learning data set of how humans navigate and learn to play these atari uh, games i think they also use uh, Minecraft and some other environments as well, and maybe probably like robotic control tasks with a joystick or something like that, but probably most generally it's the Atari suite. They have this fixed data set of human behavior, and they're trying to correlate this by retrospectively computing, taking these trajectories, and you can still compute the task or, or the uh, intrinsic motivations. Here we only see information gain and empowerment, and not the first input entropy one, just in this diagram. So they're going to be trying to compute these objectives with the fixed data sets and then see how well they correlate with human behavior. This next paper is titled Large Scale Clinical Interpretation of Genetic Variants Using Evolutionary Data in Deep Learning. The motivating problem is that we have these disease-related genes. 
We believe that these uh, genes are correlated with different diseases, and we have these slight variations in each individual, and we want to know what kind of consequences these will have. So here's the interesting thing from our machine learning perspective. Previously, what they've been trying to do is fit clinical labels. So they do have clinical labels with respect to the patients, and then uh, where do they describe the clinical labels? Or in this paragraph, they describe the clinical labels. So previously, what they've been trying to do is they have these uh, disease-related genes, they have the sequence, and they're trying to fit this with these clinical labels. But these clinical labels, they're noisy, they're sparse, they're small data sets. It's hard to uh, map, say, these high-dimensional protein sequences with these sparse clinical labels. So here's the new thing from our, uh, something that we can easily understand as deep learning, uh, you know, people who study deep learning and machine learning, is that what they're studying is instead of trying to fit these uh, clinical, noisy clinical labels, they're going to try to use a generative model. So this is the theme we've been seeing. Uh, last weekly update, we looked at Facebook's ESM 1 billion protein language model. In this case, they're using a Bayesian variational autoencoder. So the core difference between the variational autoencoder and the language model is the same difference between BERT and GPT. BERT is a denoising autoencoder. GPT is an autoregressive left to right thing. They both do self-supervised generative learning. So in this case, they're going to use the generative model to learn better representations that help them do this downstream task of this uh, Eve thing they're doing. So now the paper is going to cross into something where you need a bit of a biology background. And, you know, I wasn't really able to understand this all that well, but, you know, I'm studying it and hopefully eventually I'll get it. But the idea is that uh, they're, they're going to, they have this strategy to assess the effects of thousands of mutations in parallel. And they have these assays, which is how they are going to, you know, on the biology side, how they're going to see what kind of uh, like chemical properties are coming out of doing these mutations to these uh, protein sequences. So this is the downstream task. And, you know, it's a bit hard to completely understand what's happening if you only have a deep learning background. But the core thing for us to take away, I, I believe, is that they're moving from trying to do supervised learning with noisy clinical labels, small data sets, probably massive overfitting. And instead, they're looking to do generative models. They do this multiple sequence alignment where they have this neighborhood of related sequences and doing this denoising autoencoder, it probably learns really good representations of the data that they then use for this downstream task of seeing what kind of chemical properties emerge from running uh, thousands or I don't know how many mutations in parallel. I'm really excited to report the next addition to the pattern exploiting training research. Pattern exploiting training is showing that in this pre-trained and fine-tuned pipeline, there should be more of a handoff between the pre-trained language model or the pre-trained whatever the pre-training task is and then the downstream uh, classification or whatever downstream task it is. So in this example, few shot text generation of pattern exploiting training, the pre-training task is the Pegasus task. So Pegasus is basically the same idea as mass language modeling or uh, the Spanberg paper more particularly, where you mask out a long sequence. So Pegasus, say you have this entire paragraph, you'd mask out from in this paper all the way to the end of this sentence. So say text generation task, and then the model has to reconstruct this masked out sequence. So this is the Pegasus idea. You're reconstructing much longer uh, masked out sequences. It's not just a masked out token. It's an entire masked out uh, sequence embedded in the denoising objective. So the idea of pattern exploiting training is that we have these patterns to probe language models to help them transition into the downstream task. So say uh, you're doing an entailment task where you have the, the training or the testing data, the new data for the downstream task is like premise, hypothesis, or, or you know these two things and then you have to do the entailment. Do, they, do these two things uh, follow one another? Do they contradict one another? Or are they completely unrelated? So what you would do with pattern explaining training is you would do X1, X2, and then you would insert this pattern. So then you'd say like insert question mark, mask, and then it uses the mask in this familiar uh, task formulation to transition itself from language modeling into natural language inference. So with the Pegasus pre-training task, you'd be recovering these long sequences from say Wikipedia, scientific papers, books corpus, something like this. So this is the pre-training objective. Now you're fine tuning it to do something like abstractive generation, or let's just say with abstractive generation. So you have these different data sets. These are the data sets that are used to do abstractive summarization. The abstractive summarization task is say you read this uh, Daily Mail article and then you write a quick summary or the, a really fun data set of this is titled TLDR and it's, um, uh, it's from the Allen Institute and what they do is they take the abstracts of papers that they've sourced from openreview.net and then they write a one to two sentence 
summary of the research paper. And these are machine learning papers, so it's fun for us who study this to uh, look through this data set and see how well abstractive summarization models perform on research studying abstractive summarization models. So this is the downstream task that the pattern exploiting training is going to help the transition to. So as a reminder, it's been pre-trained to reconstruct masked out sequences in, say, Wikipedia or something like that. And now it's being fine-tuned to generate abstractive summaries of these news articles. So these are labeled data sets. These aren't uh, completely unlabeled. They have these short summaries in these pairs. So now what they're going to be doing is they're going to be seeding the model with patterns. So it takes the news article, and then in this case, the pattern is just follow the news article with mask. Or these are kind of the more creative ways of using pattern exploiting training. You would say short summary, mask, and then the paragraph email title, mask, and then the paragraph, or say even just TLDR, mask. These, this is the idea of pattern exploiting training. You insert these patterns, these words, that help the model transition and give it more information about the downstream task it's supposed to be doing. Because in Pegasus, even though it learns to reconstruct these sequences, it doesn't have a concept of you're, you're summarizing this news article. So this is another really interesting paper, and I expect pattern exploiting training to have a massive impact. When Bird plays the lottery, all tickets are winning. This article written in The Gradient from Anna Rogers is about the perspective of looking at the lottery ticket hypothesis in BERT to see if that can help us uh, uncover some structure about how BERT is learning these language representations. And then unfortunately the answer to jump ahead is no. So uh, Anna Rogers wrote this paper, uh, this BERTology survey, and it was really great. It covered all of the papers that since BERT came out in I think 2018, how many papers have already you know, appended BERT to their title or used BERT in some way, shape, or form for some downstream task. So it's a collection of everything about BERT, analyzing what can it do, what do we know about, what kind of syntactic structure it captures, uh, where does it fail with adversarial attacks and stuff like that. So it's a really uh, comprehensive literature review of everything that's been done with BERT from its release from Google all the way up to now. So the idea in um, when BERT plays a lottery, all tickets are winning. Again, the lottery ticket hypothesis is this idea that uh, there is a subnetwork within this dense deep neural network that could be retrained from the beginning and exceed or usually just match the performance of the original full model. So the idea is that maybe we can prune away the BERT's, uh, BERT's model's self-attention head. So self-attention is usually divided up into multiple heads. And this is done to shrink the embedding dimension and probably also has some kind of information bottleneck property. But they're seeing in this paper, uh, can we prune BERT in the same way that you search for lottery tickets, where uh, there's two ways of pruning. So magnitude pruning is what's used in lottery ticket hypothesis. This is where, say, an individual weight has a low magnitude. So a weight is like 0 or 0 0.1, and we just mask that out. Structured pruning would be we try to completely remove structures in the network, like, say, eliminating an entire self-attention head or an entire uh, feed-forward like route through the network. It's like a more disciplined way or more, um, you're taking apart much more of the network in a way that would make it interpretable for humans how you've reconfigured the network or how you've pruned the network. Compared to magnitude pruning where you just have these random zero weights, it's not interpretable what's happened to the uh, network and the pruning. So the interesting finding is that with respect to finding subnetworks within the BERT architecture, most of them perform pretty well. So that's the title of uh, when BERT plays the lottery, all tickets are winners. They all tend to perform pretty well. But with respect to this study, it's not a great result because, uh, you know, these authors were hoping that there was something to the subnetworks that reveals how BERT really works. But unfortunately, the subnetworks all perform about the same. So it's hard to say exactly how pruning and finding these sparse subnetworks teaches us anything about how the BERT model is doing these tasks. This is a great transition from Anna Rogers' studies on BERTology into Jay Alomar's famous The Illustrated Transformer. So this is the best blog post out there. Uh, Yana Kilcher also has a really great video explaining the attention is all you need paper. But this is probably the thing that, you know, is shared the most when you're trying to communicate quickly what is the new thing, what is attention, what is the transformer model. So Jay Alomar now has a new interfaces for explaining transformer language models. So in the same kind of way of BERTology, the BERTology paper is trying to take apart how the BERT representations, try to probe for specific dependencies it's learned, and you know overall gain more insight into these attention maps and what it's relying on to make predictions. So this first interface, 
And so, so the way this blog post is structured is there's these two explorables. Uh, there's more explorables later on the article where you can interactively hover through and see uh, these attention visualizations. So let's go through a couple to explain it. So uh, this is a, say um, you have Austria, Belgium, or one, you have this list. And the task is it's like generating these uh, country names. So you're gonna scroll through the attention map, see how uh, currently my cursor is on Brazil. And you see the dark uh, purple on Belgium and the lighter purple on Austria. But you see uh, very light shading on one of the periods and then you know the numbers. So see when I go to four, it's gonna start waiting the three. If I put the period, it's gonna start waiting in the other periods. When I go to Hungary, it's gonna you know change the heat maps. So these are visualizations of the attention layer. You're seeing what the model is attending to as it's predicting six. So in this case, it's attending to Romania, the heaviest, and the uh, intermediate periods, not so much. So this is another case of visualizing the neuron activation. So I'm not even gonna talk about this because I don't really quite understand exactly what this is uh, exploring, but I think it's, uh, you know, they cluster a group of neurons and they have some kind of activation pattern that manifests itself in the generated text. But again, I, I'm not really sure what's going on there. So, uh, so input saliency is probably the most intuitive way of visualizing and explaining these transformers. This is where we uh, look right at the input map uh, in the same way of this, where we're, we're, this is the input and we're looking directly at the heat maps on the input. So here's another great example where uh, this is what's been generated. And as we scroll through, we can see the different weights on the previous text and another interesting visualization. So overall, this is a really cool interactive library. Uh, really interesting to see this uh, way of visualizing these attention heat maps. And I expect this to help researchers understand more about what's really happening with these attention layers. So here we are on December 28th, and it's about the time of the year where we start to recap what's happened in AI and machine learning in this year, in 2020. So here's the first one, a really great article from What's AI on YouTube, 2020, a year full of amazing papers review. So right away, I really like this format. It starts off with an overview video. Then for each of these survey papers, it has a short explanation video and then a link to the paper in the code, as well as a quick two sentence uh, summary of the paper uh, motivating throughout the narration of these uh, different things on the list of updates to AI in uh, 2020. So my takeaway from this, I think it does have a little bit of a bias towards uh, like graphics kind of things that have been enabled. So things like learning to cartoonize using white box cartoon representations and deoldify and stylize neural painting. Not trying to discount any of this, but I just think that uh, that's just my quick takeaway. I think it does have a little bit of a bias towards saying towards in the 2020 in the perspective of all the entire things that happened in AI in 2020. But anyways, here's a really cool list to look through and see some of the different things that have happened this year in deep learning and AI. Microsoft has also published a newsletter about their research in 2020. So this is a pretty long uh, list of different things. So quickly, let's look at this uh, table of contents. They talk about general things like say their deep speed library that will enable training even a trillion parameter model. So say GPT-4 with a trillion parameters. And they talk about applications in graphics and multimedia, human language technologies, medical health and genomics, programming languages and software engineering, quantum computing, security, privacy, and cryptography. So uh, there's a ton of links, a ton of things different look, uh, to look into. Papers that have been uh, produced from uh, Microsoft, like the Oscar vision language model, the deep speed library that uh, you know we started off talking about, and then these other things that they're researching uh, at Microsoft Research. In this weekly update, we also have a new natural language processing newsletter from Sebastian Ruder. So this is one of my favorite newsletters that covers uh, news in deep learning and uh, with a particular emphasis on natural language processing. So um, the theme of this uh, newsletter has three main ideas. The idea of minimum viable data sets. So in a previous weekly update, I think it was maybe two weeks ago, we looked at this new MNIST 1D proposal where uh, the author of this paper is arguing that Deep learning still has a lot to learn from these small scale data sets, particularly about things like meta learning with outer inner loop gradients, the double descent phenomena, lottery ticket hypothesis. There are these little things and not little things, but these massive research areas in deep learning that still could benefit from small scale experimentation. And the appeal of these data sets is that you can quickly train them and quickly get a sense of different uh, algorithms you're trying to put together. So Sebastian is asking, uh, what is the equivalent of MNIST in natural language processing and maybe squad or the multi natural language inference task, these two data sets, but still they don't uh, move as quickly as MNIST, I think. So the next theme is efficiency, trying to make models, uh, you know, run more efficiently. So um, 
This paper reports energy efficiency and reporting on the uh, like damage that training something like GPT-3 causes. And then this is the survey on efficient transformers. So there's a whole presentation on this. Uh, it is from researchers at Google and University of Washington. Uh, and it covers the, a ton of different, uh, the advancements in efficient transformers. So there's things like the compression, distillation, pruning, quantization, and then they're completely redesigning the transformer layer as well. So that's the difference between these models, reformer, synthesizer, sync horn, uh, performer. These are about completely redesigning the transformer layer to have say uh, data dependent uh, attention mechanism, some kind of recurrent memory. And um, so I, I did a video on this, it's in the weekly update maybe three weeks ago or two weeks ago that walks through this presentation explaining the latest in efficient transformers. So finally, the uh, newsletter concludes with the promise of procedural generation. So procedural generation is a really interesting idea. It's where you have these algorithmically constructed environments. And I think it's a really interesting way to probe for generalization. So earlier in the same weekly update video, we looked at the paper transformers as soft reasoners over language. So this is actually a procedurally generated uh, language learning environment where the procedural generation is respect to the chaining of the factual rules. So you could say, uh, test the model to combine three rules or three facts into a inference, and then you can vary that up to seven facts and you can procedurally generate the flexibility, the challenge of this kind of uh, composition of the reasoning. So it's explored heavily in reinforced learning where you generate these RPG environments or things like say the uh, parameters of the terrain and the bipedal walking agent these different uh, environments that can be algorithmically generated. So another great addition of the Natural Language Processing News, and I highly recommend uh, subscribing and checking this out. So here's a quick article titled, DeepMind's Annual Report, Why It's Hard to Run a Commercial AI Lab. So this article is a bit too high level compared to what we like to look at with these technical research papers, but it still has some interesting little details about uh, DeepMind and speculation about what this kind of thing is with respect to how Google is spending money on it. So the, it's talking about, I'd say the high level takeaway is this article is arguing that DeepMind is gonna have to be more product focused and that it can't be, it can't have this emphasis on science itself in order to justify what they're spending on it at Google. So uh, you know, I'm not gonna comment on that. I don't know something as high level as that, but um, this idea that DeepMind is gonna have to change to become more product facing because of the billions of dollars that are being spent at DeepMind. Amongst other things, this monthly edition of the Hugging Face newsletter reports the community effort to add data sets to the Hugging Face NLP data sets library. So the blog post or the uh, newsletter initially starts describing the data loaders and the pre-processing. These are the two features that are going to be included in all of these data sets included in the Hugging Face NLP library. So right here, the uh, newsletter is reporting that they're soon going to pass 600 data sets in this open source NLP data sets hub. So what does this mean for you? It means that say you're, uh, you've loaded a data set in Torch Text or Torch Vision or the built-in TensorFlow Keras data sets where you just do like uh, keras.mnist.load. It's that easy to get a data set that's ready to be pipelined into your machine learning models. And this is great because it lets you focus on the more fun aspects of configuring these deep neural networks, setting up knowledge distillation, all these kind of, you know, maybe more fun things to do than curating and pre-processing and cleaning these data sets. So now we have this interface to 600 data sets made available from Hugging Face's NLP library. So really awesome effort. And in addition to this, they have each data set has a data set card. So this data set card will give you some information about uh, what's in each of these data sets. So then some other news about uh, Hugging Face, they have a really great paper that describes the library, the tokenizers, the base uh, model, and then the classification head or whichever downstream task head. So they won the best demo paper at EMNLP for this really great paper. Uh, I've read this, it's a great read for understanding how they're organizing their Transformers library. So then they talk about the new uh, subscription service they're offering, uh, their partnership with Qualcomm, uh, Transformers 4 is out with fast tokenizers by default and an example of how to use it. Uh, then the integration with JAX, and uh, new models included, and then a new paper that they've come out about avoiding data set bias by using weak learners and saying that, you know, if this weak model in uh, machine learning, a weak model describes like a low capacity model. So usually like a decision tree is described as a weak model because uh, it doesn't have as many, like as much complexity as say a more complex model. So 
like an ensemble of weak learners is an ensemble of uh, low configuration decision trees. There's been a lot of research in AutoML with libraries like Hyperopt or Optuna that try to uh, find the right set of hyperparameters like the number of leaves, the learning rate, all these different things and say these uh, like gradient boosting classifiers. So Auto NLP is describing applying the same methodology of hyperparameter optimization to the natural language processing uh, pipelines. So we have these kinds of uh, pipelines where Right off the bat, you have to pick a tokenizer, you have to pick a vocabulary size, you have to pick an input embedding dimension. Then you have to construct the intermediate base model with you know, the number of attention heads, the intermediate embedding with that as well, and then the structure of the attention blocks. And then you have to configure the classification head. And then in addition to that, you could have hyperparameters on say the data augmentation you're using, or if you're using any kind of knowledge installation, self-supervised learning, there's all sorts of hyperparameters that can come up with respect to constructing these pipelines. So I'm really excited to see what is developed in Hugging Face's new auto NLP library. And I highly recommend joining the waitlist, filling out a quick survey to just describe to them how you use these NLP pipelines, which will help them get a better sense of how to build out this kind of library. Mm -hmm.